God is good. If you would, I'd ask you this morning to turn with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 24. Matthew 24 is sometimes called the mini-revelation, or the sister book to the book of Revelation. And it's such because at the beginning, the outset, the disciples come to Jesus and they ask him specifically, what are the signs of his coming and of the end of the world? They ask him this question, and throughout most of the chapter, chapter 24, he goes in depth to give them a, a protracted answer to their question is with the events that surround the end of the world. Now, when he says that, of course, we know that this planet uh, will be here. Uh, God's going to refresh it and renew it, but the planet will never go away. But the world system, the systems that we use to govern this world, will absolutely be demolished. When these events take place, they'll be unlike anything that the human race has ever seen. Uh, I was reading a, a commentary this past week by Dale Bruner, uh, and, and he, was, he was opening up, and I'm always looking for somebody that can really open the word up and give me more details, but he was talking in Revelation chapter 6 where the sixth seal is opened, and the book of Revelation says that the heavens departed like a scroll, and as it works down through the chapter, it says that the men ran to the rocks and said, hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne, indicating that there would be a time that Jesus will literally rip the heavens apart. He will open up the entirety of our reality and step through, <laughs> riding on a white horse, not coming as a baby in Bethlehem, but coming as a God in his glory. He will step through and he would rattle and shake the entirety of, of the whole of the human race. Well, as I begin to look at this, I find that many of the prophets of old prophesied this exact event. Many of the apostles in the New Testament also touched on this very event. And so this morning, I want to share some teaching with you from Jesus himself. And we'll just read, um, I'm going to read verse 3 and then we'll jump down to 37. Matthew 24 and 3. And as he, Jesus, sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And as I said, Jesus gave them a long, protracted uh, response. But in verse 37, he begins to compare it to Noah. He says, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you this morning that you've given us history written in advance, that you've given us prophecy that we can, we can rely on that it will come to pass. We thank you that you've opened up future events, Lord, that we could see them and be ready for them and be prepared. Father, this morning I ask you for the touch of God upon this sermon, upon my lips, and upon the ears of your people. Help this shake us all, God, down to our core, that we might realize the reality of what's about to take place. Father, in Jesus' name we pray and we thank you. Amen and amen. Now Jesus says that the end of days will be very much like the days of Noah. That life will go on light day after day after day. And then on a certain day, the destruction of God will fall. And make no, make no bones about it. When Jesus comes back, he's coming back in judgment. The scripture says he's coming back to punish the wicked. It may, he says that he's going to humble the, the people. And this morning, I don't want to split hairs whether we're talking about the rapture or whether we're talking about the second advent of Christ. I, I don't want to lose our focus on that. I want to focus on the fact that he is coming back, that he's coming back to this planet. He's coming back in a body of flesh, but yet he will not have his glory to be suppressed by the, the body that he comes in. His glory will be on full array. Now, Jesus says that as in the days of Noah, so shall also be the coming of the Son of Man. So we have to go back and we have to look at what happened in Noah's day. What were the particulars that we need to be aware of? The first thing that we have to realize is that 
from the book of Genesis all the way to the life of Noah, read the entire Bible, it had never rained one time. We know that in Genesis there was a mist that came up from the ground like morning dew that watered the plants, but you will find nowhere in the Bible that it ever rained. In fact, there are many commentators that believe that God would have had to explain to, to Noah what a flood was. God never told him it was going to rain. He said that a flood was going to come. And many believe that he had to explain, perhaps, what a flood was to Noah. So it had never rained. The people had never, uh, they had never, this was something so far outside of anything that they could imagine. Just like Jesus coming back is so far out of anything that we can easily imagine. Day went on, one day rolled out after another day. Things continued as they always has. And I'm, I'm reading from uh, Genesis 7, 11. It says, in the 600th year of Noah's life. Now let me stop there because I, I, I just want to put some emphasis on that. If you can't believe that Noah was 600 years old, you probably have a problem with the rapture or the second advent. Noah was actually not really that old for the men of that days. I believe, if, I believe Methuselah lived 935 years or 38 years, one of the two. So it says that in the 600th year of his life, in the second month and the 17th day, the same day all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. Now you'll notice that the Holy Spirit was faithful to record the exact day that it happened. Now no man knows the day or the hour that Jesus is coming back, just like no man knew the day or the hour that the flood was going to begin. God never told Noah when it was going to happen. But God has a day. God knew all along, if we used our calendar, it was February 17th. God knew all along that was the day he was going to start that flood. And there is a day that God has that he's going to stop the world systems from running as they have been, and the kingdoms of this world are going to become the kingdoms of our God and his Christ. Man's ways are going to be completely ripped down without any regard to how long those systems have been in place. And I don't know about you, but I thank God for that. It says that in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day, all the fountains of the great were broken up. It means simply that it wasn't just that rain fell for 40 days and 40 nights. But it meant that the earth has water inside of it, that the water began to rise from the bottom up as well it began to rain from the top down. If you look back at the original creation, it says that the whole planet was covered with water. And God said, let there be a firmament. And his word went down into the water. And the power of that word lifted the top parts of the ocean up and they expanded to clouds as we see them today. If you check with scientists, it is a fact. 16 million tons of water hit the earth every second. That is an ocean that's hanging over your head. We got a good part of it here just the other night, didn't we? <laughs> that's so much water over our heads that if it all fell, we'd, we'd be back under the water the entire planet. So the, 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 and here's the point that I want to make. Noah had no idea what a flood was. He had no idea what rain was. He had never experienced it. But that didn't stop God from bringing it. You and I have never experienced what it would be like for God to burst in on our reality in his full glory. But just because we haven't experienced it does not mean that it can't happen. And in fact, it is going to happen. And I hope it happens soon. Now back in Matthew uh, 24 verse 38, Jesus goes on, he says, because as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking. Now notice they were not stealing and killing. They were eating and drinking. You got to do that if you want to live. They were marrying and giving in marriage. The scripture says marriage is honorable. So this is not to say that the whole world was like Sodom and Gomorrah with just wickedness running everywhere. It, it, it's not saying that these people were about their daily business. They were doing what they were supposed to be doing. It says marrying and giving in marriage until, until. What was going on in the days of Noah was not so much sinful activity as it was a sinful indifference to the things of God. 
And we find that now, in our culture now, there is the same indifference to the things of God. Suddenly, our, our, our sports addictions are more important than the things of God. Our entertainment addictions are more important than the things of God. It's more important that we get our 5 o'clock Facebook post accurate than it is to accurately understand theology. And it's very much the same way. The, I'm going to give you this up front. The whole point of this that Jesus is telling us is don't allow your focus to be so much on this present world that you are blinded to what's hanging over our heads right now. Now, God promised there'll never be another flood. He put his bow, the rainbow in the sky is a promise. There will never be another flood because he's coming back himself. So it says that they were eating and drinking. They were marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah got in the flood. You know, some people will never believe that Jesus is ever going to do anything like what we're going to see in the near future. Some people will just say, no, thing. all things continue as they have from the beginning. There are whole denominations that are already set up right now. Swallowing up hundreds of thousands of people and teaching that, no, there, there is no eschatology. There is no apocalypse. There's no revelation. All of that's not going to happen. Noah, for 100 years, he preached that a flood was coming. For 100 years, the people, he built a, a ship so big without modern techniques and equipment, a massive ark he built. He was the talk in that whole region. And he would tell the people, there's a flood coming, there's a flood coming. And many of them had simply this indifference. Well, it ain't raining today. Well, I'm cool now. You find right now in society, people are talking a lot of mess. <laughs> people, their, their pride is just, it's, it's, the, their cup has run over. Where they'll, they'll stand and they'll rail their fists at God and they'll blaspheme his son and they'll blaspheme his Holy Spirit. Saying all things continue as they were. There's no God. Nothing's going to happen until Noah got in the flood. I mean, into the ark. And can you imagine how quickly the conversation changed? Can you imagine how quickly things turned around? When people suddenly are standing in all of their pride and arrogancy, and in one second they're stripped to stark naked fear in their life. Because they're looking at him that sits on the throne. Here's what Revelation is talking about when the sixth seal is broken. It says the heavens depart like a scroll. Now, there's two schools of thought. One is that the canopy that covers this earth is what is described as the heavens. The other is talking about the entirety of the universe. I'm going to pull your minds a little bit. The universe goes out in one direction 14.5 billion light years goes in the other direction, 14.5 billion light years, and God's going to grab it all and rip it apart and step inside of it in all of his glory. And, and Revelation says that the mighty men and the, 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 the presidents, the prime ministers, they ran to the rocks and the mountains and said, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits upon the throne. That means that you will stand right on the planet, look right up, and you can see him. He's right there. I'm looking right at his face, and it's angry. And cause such fear in their life that they run underground to get away from his gaze. That day is coming. Doesn't matter how much the world don't like it. <laughs> Doesn't matter how much people don't believe it. But not one jot, not one tittle of that word shall in no wise pass away until every piece of it has been fulfilled. God don't hang his word out and, ju and just not look after it. It may take a hundred years. It may take a thousand years. It may take two thousand years to come to pass. But come to pass, it will. So they married, they, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. Now, there are several of the New Testament uh, writers that spoke of this day. Here's what Paul said in Thessalonians 5 and 2. He says, for yourself know perfectly that the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord is his return, the day he returns. It comes as a thief in the night. Now, what, what does that mean? 
The thief never comes and knocks on your door, says, hello, I'm a thief. Next Thursday at 730, I'll be by to rip your stuff off. Thief don't operate like that. The thief operates in stealth. He operates in secret. He makes sure nobody knows that he's moving. And that's how the second coming of Christ is. He said, no man knows the day or the hour. Not the angels of heaven, not even the sun. They asked him, they said, when is this going to happen? He said, it's not for you to know the day or the hour. I don't even know. God has hidden that within his own heart. But he's got a day just like the, the February 17th. He had a day that the flood began. And he's got a day that our judgment is going to begin. And let me just throw this in because you may be thinking, well, good. We need to tear them up, Lord. Uh-uh. Judgment begins in the house of the Lord. Judgment begins in the house of the Lord. And if the righteous do scarcely make it, in other words, you ain't just going to wobble in. You're just good. You, if you get in, it's going to be like this. <laughs> because there's a lot of pride just right in the house of God. A lot of arrogance, a lot of rebellion right in the house of God. But the day's coming. You know, they had the same thing when the Holy Spirit fell in Pentecost. And they had two, Ananias and Sapphira. They had no regard for the things of God. They had no respect for, the, for the, 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 the dignity of the Holy Spirit. Just walked right up in front of Peter with a lie in their mouth. And I think rebellion in their heart. And Peter looked at Ananias and said, why has Satan filled your heart? You thought that was the Holy Ghost, didn't you? Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? And his wife came in several hours later with the same lie in her mouth, and Peter spoke death on her. While she was alive, he said, them feet are those men that carried your husband out. They're on their way over. They're going to carry you out too. And she died at his word. Judgment needs to start back in the house of God. See, we have no fear left in the house of God now. Oh, I'm not getting many amens. Folks, they, they, don't, they don't reverence. They don't fear God anymore. We got people all across the nation. They will, right after the service, clear out all the seats and put down the basketball hoop. And we're going to play basketball in the sanctuary. What in the world? Could you imagine playing basketball in the Holy of Holies? If you just stepped in there, if the high priest stepped in there, wasn't dressed right. Oh. Oh. We'll wear anything to church now. <laughs> I'm not beating folks up. Wear what you got, but get something better. <laughs> you know, you, when a sinner comes in off them streets, I know when I came in, I didn't know what I was doing. I'm just trying to, I'm, I'm saved. I just, I just want to serve the Lord. But as soon as I began to look around and say, oh, wait a minute, I'm kind of I'm out here. I tried to bring myself into conformity, but now to conform is wrong in the mind of modern culture. Conformity now is the evil thing in the mind of the modern culture. And what do you see? You see young people now. I seen a man the other day. My heart broke. I mean, the tear welled up in my eye. His whole face was tattooed. He had like four or five rings through his bottom lip. He had some rings through his nose. His ears were gauged like this big, a big hole in his earlobe. And it was a meme that said, I can't get a job. I said, well, I guess you can't get a job. Because our rebellion against conformity has now put us out into the extreme. But saints, Jesus is coming back to fix all that. This that you see happening now, this is a temporary thing. This ain't going to go on very long. This is a temporary thing. And I, I hate to know, I hate to see that people have destroyed themselves just because it's culturally cool to do so. I mean, you know, back years ago when sailors used to go to sea, they'd get a tattoo of an anchor on their arm or, or a woman or mom or something. But as the years have progressed, the tattooing industry has grown. I'm not beating you up. I'm just telling you what happened. And it has continued to grow now till folks got tattoos all across their face, all across. I mean, they got their baby's names on, tattooed across their chins, across their forehead. It's like... Bro, what, what are you thinking? I know it's quiet. I'm going to just tell you now, I'm an employer. If you come here with tattoos on your face, you can't get a job here. I don't care if you're black or white. I don't care where you come from, what language you talk, but you can't have a tattoo on your forehead. I ain't going to hire you. 
And it don't mean I'm mad at you. Don't mean it just means that I don't want you to represent who I am. Won't hire you. Okay, I'm off my message. <laughs> if you think about putting one on your face, don't do that. Keep them on, at least under your collar. You got them all up like this. It ain't going to work, and you ain't going to like it five years from now. You're going to wish you hadn't have done that. I, I talk to people all the time that have tattoos, and they're like, man, I wish I hadn't ever done this. But in the moment, you get the Dallas Cowboy, and the star goes all up over your ear. <laughs> And when they start losing, <laughs> I go, no, you're a loser. <laughs> so if you think about doing that, don't, don't do that. Understand that at some point in time, you're going to have to represent what it is to be a professional. And don't, don't follow this rap business because it's just a flash in the pan. Somebody said, but it's been here 20 years. Don't worry, it won't be here eternally. It's temporal. It won't be here that long. I'm fussing this morning. It says, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. When they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Now notice what happens. When they say it's all good, bro, peace and safety is all good. Get your, get your Instagram memes in order. That's all we're going to be doing. We're just going to flow. But right when they say peace and safety, the Bible says sudden destruction comes upon them. As travail upon a woman with child. Now, obviously, not, I'm not a woman and I've never had a child, but I've seen the process. And once it starts, you can't stop it. <laughs> I said once it starts, it's going all the way through. So he goes on to say, let me get back on because I'm running out of time. Uh, Matthew 24, 39 it says, uh, let me read into it. They were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage until the, day, until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came. Meaning that they had judgment hanging over their heads for a hundred years. Two and a half generations, the judgment hung over their head and they didn't know it. And how many today don't know? Don't know judgment is hanging over our heads right now. See, it, it, the, the day is coming that uh, it's not going to matter how much your tennis shoes cost. The day is coming. I heard one woman say this, and she's absolutely right. If you didn't choose Jesus, whatever you chose, it ain't going to matter. <laughs> if you didn't choose Jesus, whatever you did choose, it won't matter. They didn't know. For a hundred years he preached, and they didn't know until the flood came, and then they had a fully developed education in what a flood was. My, my wife and I went to a Noah's Ark in, a, where was that at? Kentucky, um, some time ago. And they had a, a little model set up within the ark that we were looking at, and it was the ocean and the ark set there on the ocean near, near the tops of mountains. And they had people on the mountains and some in the water, and some holding on to pieces of scrap, all of them screaming towards the ark, let me in, let me in. But once that door is shut, it's sealed. Let, let me say something. Once Jesus steps back on this planet, time is frozen. You're now in eternity. There, there's time. There'll still be days and hour, but, but eternity has just started. And, and the psalmist, I believe it was, he said, the way that tree falls, that's the way that tree lays. If the tree falls to the north, it doesn't get up later on and fall over to the south. And if you fall in your sin and your rebellion, you can't get up after he gets here and say, oh, now nah, I'm ready to get right now, Lord. No, today is the day. If you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Today is the day to get right. That's why he's telling us this whole parable. He says, for they knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Meaning that when he comes back, death will be in wholesale numbers. The destruction will be on every hand. And if you look at, just look at the United States today. Just look at it. The, the human condition, the way the human mind is constructed. 
the, the, the political upheaval that we're having now, the cultural upheaval that we're having now, the societal upheaval, there's only one way to fix it. A whole lot of people got to die. <laughs> because one thing about us, we stubborn. We are a stubborn bunch. And once we've set our compass that we're going a certain direction, right, wrong, or indifferent, we just keep plowing into that, into that direction. But Jesus comes back, and here's what it says. Now, now, Paul has preached this. Joel has preached this. John has preached it all to different extents, but I'm reading from Isaiah. It says, How ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. I know we, we all see a loving God, and He is a loving God, but He's equal. If you, if you know your Bible, you see that His mercy endureth forever, right? But His judgment also endureth forever. Verse 9 of that same passage says, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh cruel, both in wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and to destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations shall not give their light, and the sun shall be darkened in its going forth, and the moon shall not cause to give her light to shine. Here's what this is saying, is that when Jesus steps back in his full glory, it's going to be just like when you step out at night, you can see the stars. If there's no clouds out, you can see the stars. But when the sun rises in the morning, all the stars stop shining. When Jesus steps out in his glory, you won't even notice whether the sun's up or down. <laughs> you won't notice whether it's moon. Well, you, it, you won't even, all your, every focus will be upon him and his magnificence and in his glory. It goes on to say, and I will punish the world for their evil. Man, that's strong stuff. That ought to scare you. Does that shake you? It shakes me. <laughs> I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity, and I will cause the arrogancy of the proud is over. And I will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. Saints, this day is coming. It's been prophesied for millennia. It, it's been prophesied through the mouths of countless prophets and apostles. This day is coming. So what do we do, preacher? If it's coming, the destruction's coming, we can't stop it. What do we do? Here's what you do, Matthew 24, 42. He says, watch. Watch, therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. The word watch means to be vigilant and to stay awake. It means don't be lulled to sleep into a life of just uh, being at ease in Zion. Thinking that your life is every day going to be just about your job and your house and your car and your rotation around the truth. That, that day is almost at an end. And all of a sudden it's going to be a new day and a new time. So he tells you and I to watch. Meaning stay aware of where we are in terms of, 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 of future prophecy. In terms of what's happening to God's time clock Israel. You can just look right now. I, I can. I, I'm hoping that you're seeing what I'm seeing. For a long time, decades now, the family unit has unraveled and man has created a new family unit. Are you with me there? But now we're beginning to see society as a whole unravel. Our school systems, our, the systems that have, for the, in this country, gone on for hundreds of years that have have produce good things, now is beginning to unravel. But now our government is beginning to unravel. The very foundations. The, the Bible says that when the foundations be shaken, what can the righteous do? That's happening right now. We, and it's not just happening here in the United States. This is happening in every country, no matter what kind. Iran, they just had a military parade. I think they had 14 people killed. In a military parade, folks just came out and shot them down. The same thing is happening in all of the Islamic countries, just a lot of them, don't ever, you never hear about it because they can suppress the news. But the whole world right now is beginning to unravel. 
And we are right at the very hour. Jesus, if you read the 24th chapter, he said nation would rise against nation. That doesn't mean necessarily Canada against the United States. The word nation is ethos. It means ethnic. Ethnicity will rise against ethnicity. And what do we hear now in the news so often? White privilege, black privilege. He white, they black, this whatever. Folks, we're all human beings and we're in trouble and the judgment is hanging over our heads. We need to drop all that and get right with God. Glory. We need to just get right with God. Verse 43, but know this. Here's what he's talking to you and I. But, but understand this. That if the good men of the house had known in what watch or at what time the thief would come, he would have watched. That makes sense, don't it? And would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Well, you and I, we can't know the day or the hour, but we can definitely see that the season is upon us. That means that we need to come aside. We need to find our... God needs to become our focus of life. Not our jobs, not our careers, not, uh, not, not our homes or our car, not, not any of those things. But God himself needs to become the focus of our lives. I woke up yesterday... Uh, yesterday night, uh, I don't know what time it was, but I woke up and I was just in that, in that place where you're half sleep and you're half woke. And all of a sudden I realized that my heart was just worshiping the Lord. I mean, I was just in a state of praise and worship and just giving him thanks and I'm asleep. And I woke up and I'm, I, I was already, in my worship I was already worshiping. I mean, in my sleep I was already praising him. And just mainly just thanking him. How many of us just thank God? How many of us are just aware of the goodness of God, the good things that he does for us? We need to get to a place that we're more aware of eternity than we are of where we're at right now. Because whether you're aware or not, you know the little game we used to play? Ready or not, here I come. <laughs> Ready or not. The king is coming. He would have watched if he had known. Musicians, please come back uh, to the stage. If he had known in what watch the thief of the night of the thief would come, he would have watched. Well, you and I don't know the day or the hour, but we know we're in the season and we need to be watching. That means stay awake, be attentive. Verse 44, therefore, therefore means based on everything that I just said based on everything that Jesus has just given us in that. Therefore, be ye ready. He's coming. It's just a matter of, are you going to be ready or not? Am I going to be ready or not? That's the only question. There's no question as to whether he's coming. For in such an hour that you think not. When there's a temptation there to say, what shall I say to my soul? Eat, drink. Be merry. All, everything is good. In such an hour as we think not, the Son of Man cometh. Jesus is coming back. You can split hairs over is it a rapture or is it a second advent? There's nothing wrong with that. It's good to try to understand it, but you need, your primary understanding needs to be this. He is coming back. He's not coming back to be spit upon. He's not coming back to negotiate. Here's the boldness of God. Here's the boldness of God. God sends one man from heaven. One man stands up to the whole of the human race and says, repent. That's what he did in his incarnation. Well, when he comes back the second time, he's coming back in his glory. <laughs> and how much, how much more bold will he be? Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Would you bow your heads, please, all over the room? Father, we love you this morning. We thank you. I've done my best, Lord, to preach the judgment is in the air. Father, we ask you right now that you let this message just shake us. Shake us. Wake us up, oh God. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Help us to arise and shine, oh God. We're children of the day and not of the night. Let this word just shake us. Father, I ask you that your Holy Spirit would bring conviction upon my heart, the hearts of your people. 
that we turn from this world, that we turn back to you. Come on, all over the room, would you stand to your feet? Why don't you just ask God for yourself? If you're the head of the house, ask for your household. God, shake us in this hour. Shake us, make us know that our days have an end. Make us to know that you're returning to this world. God, as your prophet Isaiah said, is to punish the wicked, those that have rebelled, those that have walked in arrogancy. Father, we ask you today, oh God, that you would shake the family, shake the households of those here in the worship room, those watching by webcast. Touch the lives of your people, oh God. Help us to be ready. Come on, reach out to the Lord. Praise you, Jesus. We need you today. Oh, Lord God, we call on you today, God. Help us to be ready, Lord God. Change us today. Let it not just be a momentary thing, but God, we need you until Jesus comes. We need your grace. We need your help to stay ready because it is a sure thing. He is coming in the clouds of glory. He's coming to rapture his saints. Hallelujah. And he warns us over and over, be ready. Today is the day to repent. Because after he comes, it's too late. Help our homes, Lord God. Help our children, Lord God. Help our nation. Oh, Lord, we pray for our nation. Let judgment begin so that we can be ready for the coming of the Lord. Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Let, let this word just grip your heart. Don't forget about it. It's important that God's people know that they need to be ready. It is a sure thing. He is coming, and He is coming soon. I believe we're at the end of the, of the last days. So be ready. Live your life ready for His coming. Amen. Praise God. Well, we love you. We thank you for uh, joining us this morning. Those that have joined us by webcast, please join us again. We'll be back at 11 Central Standard Time. And those in the house, why don't you greet one another? God bless. You are dismissed.